um, you know, as we continue down the applications track. I do have a quick public service announcement. For anyone interested in learning more about life at Snorkel and our open roles, you can use the virtual booths section uh, at the top of the screen to speak with you know, our Snorkel team. We have Cheryl uh, at the booth and she'll be there for a while. But without further ado, I think we should get into our, uh, our, our lightning talks. Before we, we dive in, there is a poll that you'll see in the polls tab that talks about just the event so far. So if you're enjoying uh, you know, this conference so far and the applications track, you can just go to the poll and leave a quick message. But you know, we, we can, in the, in the meantime, get started with welcoming data, a data scientist from the Smithsonian Institute here to talk about data-centric AI. Mike Trisney. Cool. All Mike, right. great to have you with us. Thank you. I am going to share my screen. All right, great. So, hi, my name is Mike Trisna, and I'm a data scientist with the Smithsonian Data Science Lab. I'm going to give you a glimpse into some of the ways we are using data-centric AI practices at the Smithsonian and hopefully convince you that cultural heritage institutions like the Smithsonian can be valuable partners in your AI research and applications. Okay, so what is the Smithsonian Institution? Uh, you should be familiar with the concept that machine learning models do best when they are developed in close contact with domain or subject matter experts. Well, the Smithsonian is a unique institution with domain experts spread across 21 museums, 21 libraries, nine research centers, and a zoo. Our mission statement taken from our original charter in 1848 is to be an establishment uh, for the increase and diffusion of knowledge, which I think is so cool. Um, so the way that the data science lab operates is to partner with uh, domain experts at the Smithsonian on research projects that apply AI to the work that researchers are already doing. Um, in these research projects, we are slowly building up internal expertise in all stages of the uh, machine learning pipeline from data set creation and exploration to model training and deployment. Okay, so what kind of data are we using in these projects? Um, if you've been lucky enough to visit any of our museums in the DC area, you probably saw hundreds of artifacts on display in the context of educational exhibits. Uh, but in those same buildings and others that are dedicated just to storage, we have millions of objects in drawers where scientists and historians can study them in detail. But as we learn with the pandemic, this model of working hands-on with physical objects is limited. Uh, this is why the Smithsonian has been putting a ton of effort into digi digitizing these collections so that anyone around the world can work with those same objects. Uh, so here and in this video that's a little frenetic uh, is a bird's eye video of a conveyor belt that was used by the Smithsonian Digitization Program Office or DPO to digitize pressed plant specimens from the botany collection. Almost 4 million plant specimens were digitized this way. Okay, so now I'm gonna switch gears to talking about some of the cool projects we're, we're doing with the, these digitized objects. Um, Alex White, a data scientist with the lab, worked on a research project uh, with fern experts in the botany department uh, to create a fern species classifier. Um, having a model that tells you the species of a specimen isn't really very useful. Uh, we have specimen labels on all of these sheets that say exactly what it is, uh, but investigating the model itself provided valuable insights into the evolutionary processes of fern leaf shape, size, and geographic distribution. Uh, one data-centric AI aspect of this project is that Alex was able to increase the accuracy of this model by building a separate unit segmentation model that masked only fern pixels. Um, as you might be able to see in this uh, cluster image to the right. Um, we ran this against the whole collection and found thousands of sheets with zero fern pixels, um, mostly because a specimen was just a, a closed envelope of leaves or seeds that was fed onto that conveyor belt like all of the other sheets. Uh, another project uh, that was part of the Smithsonian American Women's History Initiative, uh, we're using uh, machine learning tools to more accurately extract women's names and mentions from diverse collections and archives across the Smithsonian. Uh, an example illustrating the need for this work is the case of Mary Vo Walcott, a naturalist and illustrator from the early 20th century. Uh, Tiana Curry, uh, a summer undergraduate intern in 2019, 
found instances where specimens collected by Mary were attributed to her husband, Charles Walcott, a paleontologist and Smithsonian secretary. Uh, highlighted in the red boxes here uh, are labels where you can see Mary's name written either out as uh, Mary Vo Walcott on the left or as Mrs. Charles D. Walcott on the right. Um, both of these specimens uh, were collected after Charles's death. So we can be quite certain that Mary collected both. Um, because Mrs. and husband's name is very commonly found in our collections and archives, we're building custom tools to make sure we extract not just the first and last names from these collections, but also those honorifics, in this case, uh, Mrs., so that we capture more accurately the mentions and contributions of women. Um, here's an example of the original uh, digitized part of the Smithsonian Annual Report um, and the output from a named entity recognition model being developed by postdoc fellow William Mattingly. Um, you can see highlighted two people uh, here, one of which is labeled as a woman because of the Miss honorific. At the very bottom, you can also see that the pronoun her is also extracted. Uh, this is important as it will allow us to cross-reference women whose name may not be accompanied by an honorific and also to ensure that we are not misgendering anyone solely based on their name. Okay, so here's one last uh, AI uh, project example from our group. Uh, it's yet another biology uh, example, but we do have ongoing co collaborations with our history and art museums. Um, so in this project, Alex Robillard uh, partnered with local scientists in the Peruvian Amazon to build a fish species classifier app that we built in Streamlit. Uh, this app was uh, used to monitor the increase and decrease in fish species after an oil pipeline was built across the river. Uh, this project is a great application of data-centric AI because we were able to increase the accuracy of the model by supplementing it with images from the Natural History Museum fish collection. See, those specimens uh, that you can see here sitting in, uh, in drawers and on shelves are just waiting for real-world applications. Okay, so I hope you've seen some of the ways that we are putting data-centric AI into practice at the Smithsonian, but why are cultural heritage institutions in general vital partners in AI work? Well, first of all, we're sitting on mountains of expertly labeled curated data sets that are usually open access. Uh, here's a photo of the Smithsonian Secretary Lonnie Bunch at the launch of the Smithsonian Open Access Initiative. Uh, you'll see some of the stats here about the open access data that we make available. Um, and one more reason to partner with us is that uh, as a field, uh, librarians, archivists, and museum specialists have been thinking really hard about ethical data, data set construction for a long time. Uh, so here's a, a screenshot of a great paper from Joe and Gabriel about how the AI field can learn valuable lessons from cultural heritage institutions. So thanks so much for listening to my talk. I uh, mentioned a lot of members of the lab specifically. There are too many cool projects to include, uh, but I would specifically like to acknowledge uh, Rebecca Dico a data scientist with the lab who acted as a PI on most of the projects mentioned here. Um, and also mentioned, uh, uh, call out some additional uh, organizations that we partner with uh, extensively and my own Twitter handle. Thanks so much, Mike. We really enjoyed the talk. Thanks so much for spending this time with us. And thank you for including your uh, Twitter handle. I think, you know, it's great to, if people are interested in following along, you know, that'd be awesome. And, Thanks so much, Mike. Um, for the audience, please feel free to kind of rate this session in the uh, poll that just opened up. And now you will automatically be transitioning into our next lightning talk, where we'll have a conversation on speech AI demystified. We'll see you there.